Can I get a massive round of applause for Daniel? Um, so now I have to juggle with the microphone and my clicker. Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Daniel. I'm the uh, developer advocate at Cloud66. And today my presentation is about how the hell do I run Docker in production and will it scale? So let me just tell what a developer advocate is. I'm just a little bit in the middle between DevOps, UX, and the business. Um, so at Classic 6, probably the half of the time I'm engineering, uh, I'm, in, I'm part of the engineering team working on our two products, Classic 6 for Rails and Classic 6 for Docker. And uh, today I'm going to share all the learnings we uh, got from our platform. So basically what we're doing, we build, deploy, and manage your application on any cloud. Uh, you provide, and we're running Docker in production for almost one and a half years. And on an average, we manage 4,000 servers. And most of our customers are using AWS, so we manage about 3,000 servers on AWS, and the rest is divided uh, on this notion their own servers, and, um, packets, bare metal, and all that stuff. Um, so today, um, I'm not going to talk about what Cloud 6 is doing. This is more about when you want to run Docker in production, where do you uh, start? Um, so, that's my talk. Um, okay, I, I put on this picture. So, before I joined Cloud 6, I worked for a digital agency here in Amsterdam. I run the digital department, and a lot of times when we're creating solutions for our customers, we look at this nice ball of fruit, all the solutions we, can, we find in the open source community, like, for instance, sometimes we had a project where we want to talk to like a WhatsApp API, and then you have this great open source project in Python, and then, you know, okay, so I have one to, you know, connect this Python API to Ruby, and then do something in Java, and then we do this and that, and blah, blah, blah. And then I was like, okay, so how do we run this thing in production? And I was like, okay, well, we have to provision a VM, and install all these libraries, and blah, 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 blah. And uh, three years ago, when, when Docker came around, we were like, oh, this is quite interesting. This is what, what basically solves a lot of problems in the company, because now I can just, you know, run a container with, with, uh, with a Python uh, uh, process, and then one container, which is Java, and I just run it on one server, or multiple services. But when I started uh, with Docker, I felt a little bit like this. So this is a, actually, if you go to Rotterdam Harbor, um, in the Heidplatz, there's this sculpture. And this is what I felt when I first picked up Docker. I was like, okay. And this is still also, when I talked to a lot of customers, they were like, okay, so how does Docker fit in this IT landscape? How do I use this? Um, so where do I start? And then I you containerize your first application, and now how do you run it on a server, and how will it scale, and all that stuff. And this is also um, a little bit like who's playing an instrument, like a music, musical instrument. Who's playing a musical instrument? Okay. So when you start learning an instrument, it's like also learning new technology. Um, so you have time and skills. So over time, your skills will will yeah, will increase. So in theory, yeah. in theory, yes, <laughs> in theory with musical instruments, it's also the same with Docker. Oh, oh, that's my experience, and when I talk to a lot of people who are using that, they're the same. So when you pick up an instrument, you start playing, and you feel like, you know, okay, this is going right there. You start doing, you start somewhere here, and you're like, okay, I pick up the guitar, I pick up Docker, and then I start uh, jamming, and in a small amount of time, you feel like, okay, I'm mastering this instrument. Yeah, I mean, I can play like, I know, uh, like a like flea of, of uh, red or chili peppers. But then, then you realize, and you want to just show, this is when you do Docker, you, you basically don't know shit, so you start with Docker wrong, uh, hello world thing. And in the end, you want to run in production, just the same with your, when you're playing an instrument. In the end, you want to you know, get on stage and, and play you know, the instrument from here to heaven. But there's a learning curve there. And the problem is that, basically, when you're starting learning the instrument, you're on this point where you say, okay, I'm not there yet. And that's a little bit the same with Docker. <clears throat> when you start playing with Docker, in the end you're like, okay, I have this thing containerized, how do I run that thing in production? And basically, they're like, okay, I need a little bit more to do to run that thing in production. So basically, you, you know what kind of skills you need. And this is where this, is, this gap, I call technology noise. This is where 
where it's sometimes difficult to, to find out, okay, so what all the ingredients I need to run that thing in production. And I hope today with this presentation, I can give you a little bit of a shortcut. So instead of that you falling down and like, okay, Docker is shit because it's not working and I have to do a lot of plumbing and hard work and all that stuff, I try to, to help you to, you know, navigate through that noise in a little bit of a shortcut. I don't know if I, if I succeed, but uh, hopefully also today with the second speaker, maybe we have a nice round uh, uh, evening to, to help you navigate that noise. So basically what you're looking for is your minimal lovable service. And you don't want to die that prematurely because you're doing it wrong in the beginning. So, um, so what I'm going to do today is to I split my presentation in two parts. So first I'm going to talk about how do you create the right image. Creating the right image is basically <coughs> the foundation of running Docker in production. So that's what I'm going to talk about first. And then the second one is how do you run Docker in production and what do you need? Who's running a Docker in production right now? That's good. Last summer I did a Docker uh, meetup too, and then I asked how many people are running Docker crystals. One, now I have six, so we're getting there. <laughs> so, because uh, I was a little afraid that everybody showed their hand and was like, okay, I can just pick up my bags, but it's not. Um, so, let's get a step back. So, a long time ago when you want to, you know, run an application, you just do provisioning bare metal, you install all the OS and all that stuff, and between um, running your application, uh, developing your application, running your application, that's a, that's a lot of time, so that's that red error there. So now with, with the VMs, you just you know, spin up a VM in 30 seconds and, and install all the libraries and off you go. And it's more isolated there. And then with, with Docker, you can throw in all these different technologies, it's isolated to containers. Uh, probably I don't have to repeat how this works, but, but you can see right here that between development and operations, the gap, the time is getting smaller. And if you get rid of that, you see that between development and operations, it's getting smaller and smaller. And I think, and that's also one of, one of the takeaways of this presentation, when you want to succeed with running Docker in production, you really need a good DevOps team. So containers need a smooth DevOps team. And um, so just to remind you how, what we're talking about, this is what, what Docker is promising us, right? So it's builds ship and deploy. And basically, your service is your code, your image is your Docker file, your containers is your Docker engine, and eventually you need a platform like a Docker cluster to run all of the things in production. So let's see, oh wait, this is, uh, see if this animation works. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, this is your container and you can put everything in a container. And basically, this is called, what I call the cont containerization machine. So basically, if you want to run Docker in production, you make, have to make sure that this machine is working smoothly. <coughs> so you, you push in some code in the front, do some, some Docker file, and you get, your, you get your image. But the thing is, if I throw in some shit on top of it, and then containerize that shit, and eventually you get shit, but it'll be nice little shit there. But in the end, <laughs> I mean, you get angry running that in production. Oh, well. So basically, you can, can't polish a third here. So shit in is shit out. So if you don't get your image right, then you're screwed in the end. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So basically, we're looking at the minimal level image. So that means that your image has to be the same on development, test environment, staging, and production. And I changed my slides today. So this is a little bit. Uh, so I came up with, keep images slim, stupid, so I know you know familiar with the phrase, and um, so basically an image has to be small, secure, and less presentation, and I call it performance, I do it speedy, so you can remember that it's all SSSS, stable, and set, immutable. So basically keep images small, secure, speedy, stable, and set. So that's what I'm going to talk about right now. So what do I mean with small? So basically, what I see in the wild, how people are using Docker images, they create, they treating Docker as a VM. So basically, they try to do everything in a container, which is fine, but in the end, they just want to create the smallest possible image. Because 
there's a lot of things you don't need for production. You don't need your your compile libraries. Uh, you, you you remove the compile time dependencies. You remove packages you don't need. And of course, Docker is is based on on a la layer file system, meaning that every time you change something in your Docker file, it adds an extra layer. Of course, those layers are getting pushed over to your in, in your repository, but it's good to get those things small uh, because then you know what's inside your in, inside your image. You better audit that one, and also when you change something to the image, it's much more faster to to pull it to your um, environment. So basically, I I didn't have time to create a slim image, so I created a fat one instead. So it's much easier to create an image that does everything for you than create the slim image which really needs to do the job done. So if you want to run run process in your container, make it as small as possible. Also secure. So because of the layered file system, if you pull in some secrets, it's stuck somewhere in a layer, you can remove it, but you have to scorch that image because the, the secrets are still there. So make sure that you remove all the secrets from your Docker file or from, from your image. And also patch through the latest security updates. So if you're using something like Ubuntu as a base image, which is huge, make sure that you run the latest updates. Um, mm. Right now you have twist lock and, and I believe uh, last week uh, Docker announced also if you push your images to Docker Hub, they run like security checks and can see what kind of layers you're using and, and what kind of security stuff uh, it's not running well. And, uh, and of course run the image with the right user ID. And of course test the image for all the security uh, uh, links. So you have all tools for that to just test how your images uh, are up to date. Uh, performance or speed. Uh, performance is basically two things. One is of course, I mean, it's obvious that you optimize your code for speed, but sometimes if I look at how people are using our platform and creating Docker files, they throw all the knowledge away they have before. So you see a lot of like uh, tutorials where they run like an application server inside a container which is not optimized for running in production. So make sure when you do something like, this is more for me to a developer, not to, to the operation guys, because operation guys know how to, you know, create all those performance things. But because what you see is that a lot of developers are creating those Docker files and they know their code, but do they also know how to, you know, create the right um, amount of memory and workers who have to run this container. So it's really important to optimize the code, but also test how much memory and CPU your container is going to use. Um, especially when you run on, on, a, on a Docker platform, you can of course say, okay, this one has to use only 200 megabytes of RAM and a portion of the CPU. But if that degrades the performance of your container, you're screwed too. So it's really important that you, in your test pipeline, you also implement something like load testing and test that container also before you run that in, in production. So if there's any question, you just come uh, can ask me if it's, uh, if it's not clear what I'm saying. Also, one process, what I see a lot of times is that people trying to do everything in a container, so they have an application server and a database and a implement secure uh, shell access and all those things you don't don't really need from running Docker in production because probably your platform already take care of that. So one process per, uh, per image and also the load testing. Another thing which is, which is important is what I mean with stable. And with stable is, so if you create a Docker file, you, if you, Build from scratch, you know what's going inside your Docker file. But sometimes you take a base image and you basically don't know what that base image contains. So that's a security thing. But if you say, okay, I, I, I start a Docker file and I say, okay, start Ubuntu latest, you never know when that image is updated. So please, then you, and sometimes what can happen is that you, you test your application on your local machine and you push it, push the code away, and then your Jenkins or some other continuous integration are, is building an image. And, and between those time frame, maybe it's like five, five minutes, somebody can push a new, the latest version of Ubuntu and your, your image won't work. So it's really 
important to mock that image version. Also, the runtime versions of your of your code because it doesn't make sense, and also check your image because then you can see what kind of versions you are using, and also implement proper logging. So this is really important when you have a team developing um, Docker images that you always do the same kind of logging. But in the end, you will you know combine all those logs in production, and if you have like uh, agreed to a standard, that's is more easier for you to to look at the logs and, and find. Uh, find the things you need. So immutable. So what I see sometimes that you 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 you, you start with Docker and you create, for instance, a, a Docker compose file in your computer and you compose all the images, uh, all the images together, all the services, and you you link those and then you use volumes and all that stuff and it works perfectly on your machine. But the whole thing is that you don't know how that will work in production, basically. So my advice is make it as loosely as coupled as possible. And then also uh, don't do things like this database inside an image because that image can, I mean, that container can be deleted. Think about persistency, so use all that, use external service for persistency. You can, of course, use it in a, in, in a Docker Compose file to mimic the production environment, but don't try to do, um, but what I see, if, 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 if you do like really complicated stuff, it's probably not worth to do it in a container. Probably there's a better solution for it. Um, so, so and again, minimal lovable image. That's what you're looking for. Development, test, staging, and production has to be the same. And keep images small, secure, speedy, stable, and set. So this is what I came around on... Uh, on um, on Twitter, somebody said Docker dot and then this image. Because when you start Docker, you containerize the first application, and you're like, now what? This is finding Nemo, by the way. So if you don't know this, <laughs> if you did, who didn't see this movie? I've already saw the movie. Okay. Oh, no, no, yeah. Yeah, so they try to escape from the, uh, from the, yeah, and then they go into this, this and then they fall the notion of like, now what? But that's the, whole, the thing, so you containerize the application, now what? Um, before I can talk about a platform and how to run those things in pro production, I will show you my numbers I have on how customers are using Docker in production right now. It's quite interesting to see. So let's first, like the first thing, this architecture. So 70% of our customers are using this. So what they're doing is basically monolith containerization. So they take like a Rails application or a big PHP application, Java application, make one Docker file, roll the whole thing in one container, and then deploy it. So there's basically no need for Docker here. I mean, you can do this on a VM also. But this, you see a lot, this is probably, this is, I'm not saying that this is wrong, but this is a lot. This is probably part of the learning curve. Still people are learning, running Docker in production, but you see a lot of this, this happening. And then you see something like this. So you see like a more like an API first containerization approach. So you got like a front end and an API, but still are fat images. So basically they don't scale. So basically you can use like a scheduler to schedule it around your cluster, but probably this image will, you know, get all the CPU and all the, the, the RAM you're running on your system. It's 20% of, of our customers are using this this way. And then it's getting interesting. So then they say, okay, well, let's create a thin image for my API. So then we can have like, you see the API there, so you can see like six containers running the API. Uh, so it's easy to scale up, distribute around your cluster, make it more fault tolerant, and also create like workers who do some work in the background, containerize that. So you see that it's a little bit moving, splitting the model of containerization is like 8%. And then the rest is getting into the microservice architecture. Everyone heard about microservices? <laughs> <laughs> I believe it's going to be big this year. So you see a lot of things, people playing around with how can you, you know, leverage, uh, how can you use Docker and microservices, and you see a lot of these things like uh, thin images, talking to message queues, talking to databases, workers, and you get this whole spaghetti thing here. But this is what, what a lot of people also use, like 4%. 
Um, so let's talk about platforms. So basically, if you are uh, running Docker on your local machine, and maybe in a testing environment, yeah. Which ones are most successful? What's that? Which ones are doing the best out of those that I mean, mentioned? You, performance wise, or like, I mean, all the things you see, they're running in production, so they're happy with, with providing the service to their customers. So I'm not judging if this is better, but uh, from a containerization perspective and where containers are you know, helping you achieve the things you want, then going to for tin, like, tin images and you know, doing like, stuff like this, it helps you. Do you have any stats on like how many outages they have in compared to each other? Or how many what? Outages. Uh, no. I don't have that one or something. No. I don't want to ask about maintainability or something. Oh, about this architecture you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that's is this more complex to maintain than... Well, I guess this is more complex than just maintaining one container. But uh, is there a middle way? Yeah, so, so the question is, is this more maintainable? The, the thing is, you need to, uh, before you can deploy something like this, you have to be started with, of course, your, your, your images, but also you have to make sure how your platform performs, because now you have different versions running around in your platform, so you make sure, that's also what I'm talking about later in this presentation about service discovery, is when, for instance, the API is changing to version one to version two. How is that, you know, deployed on your Docker platform, and how does uh, other who are using that API find that that version through service discovery and stuff like that? So, depending on how your platform is built, it's not much. It, it's not um, harder to do it. But um, yeah, you need something. I mean version control, and also, before you can start into Microsoft, you really need to know what you're doing, uh, and uh, so on. So, basically, if you're looking at a platform, you need a lot of things. I mean, you can run Docker on one computer on your local machine, or you can start with a Docker engine on one computer and just run uh, the thing on one computer, but if you want to really want to run that thing in production, you need a lot of things. You need like a proper development operation designed for. This is what's, what's also, if you go into Microsoft, you really need to think about how do, I, how do I develop the image and how do I deploy that to my production environment. Orchestration, discovery, scaling, data management, monitoring, and security. I will just you know, talk about that uh, uh, step by step. So this is basically, so you have to be, you know, have image guidelines. Um, how is, how is your, your um, image tested, so you create your, your, your new image, how, does, how do you test your container and deploy it in, into production? And also, which is really important uh, when I talk to my customers, is that, that we really try to mimic the development environment as a production environment. So basically, if you're developing uh, a service and it's run on your, your local computer, it has to behave the same as in production, probably not scaled out, but that you you know how it's how it's doing. Also, if you have like a lot of services, you need something like uh, integration tests on your computers and test them. Also, you need something like orchestration. So orchestration is where the magic stuff happens. So orchestration, I mean, there's a lot of discussion what orchestration really means, but it has to do with everything. Basically, you know, starting up new VMs, joining your cluster, but also uh, uh, adding extra nodes, uh, putting service on your on your on your on your cluster and things which 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 I think is important is for instance isolation of services. So what I see is that, that sometimes people think okay so let's create a, this big you know um, Docker cluster and we, I'll just put everything on it. But sometimes you don't want to run one service on the same computer and depending on your schedule you're using you can say okay just run it on that computer and that image doesn't have to run on the same computer. But sometimes it's good just to isolate also the service just by hardware and make use of resources available. So all orchestration is, okay, so I have this container, I know what kind of resources it has to use, so just put it on that computer which, which has the resources available. And self-healing, if something, you know, if a computer uh, fails, then your container has to move somewhere else. Uh, load distribution, if you're going to, for, you know, running lots of, of services, how is that load distributed around your uh, system? 
So you really need to think about orchestration. Also discovery. Discovery is, is, is about finding your service with, which requires minimal code. So you don't want to be, I mean, as a developer, you don't want to be bored by how do I find the service I need. So what you're seeing right now in the Docker ecosystem that a lot of platforms are going for DNS-based service discovery where you can say, just, you know, give me the service like API and then it comes back with, it, with, 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 with an IP number and you can connect to. And if I have like a several APIs running, then it's a round robin or another kind of strategy to find that service on your cluster. So it's really important to think about discovery and also versioning of, 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 of your services. That's, that's what you're saying is that how do you maintain like a, a big cluster of, of different versions? So what you're basically doing is when you change your, your, um, your, uh, one of your code from version one to version two, then version two is deployed on your, on, your, on your platform. And then when it's all healthy and ready to go, then it's switched. And depending on what kind of platform you're using, you can say, well, if, if some service is connected to that, to that API, just keep talking to that version one, and then if the connections are cleared, then delete it. So you have, and there's all kind of changes you, you can, uh, can find in platforms around. And also, uh, when you scale up your services, it's ultimately added to your discovery. Also, uh, scaling and scaling is a little bit what I already talking about. About, you know, you want to have a platform who can scale your containers, uh, scale your on-off jobs, and also do fillover groups. For instance, if, if you're running your thing in production, if, if your data center goes down, you just want to take over another data center. So sometimes it's good to, to know that that kind of things you need from a platform. And also do all the load balancing for you. Um, other things you want to take care of is, is data management. Um, so, what I see a lot of times is, I mean, a lot of databases are not cloud native, like MySQL, for instance. So it's kind of hard if you run MySQL in a in a container. What do, are you going to do with the persistent data? I mean, you can store it, of course, on your host. But if the host goes down, where does your data go? And how do you take care of, of data uh, data backups and all that thing? So if you run like MySQL in a container, then you need a lot of things around it to do the backups. Um, so my take is that, I mean, try to run the database not in a container, which is not cloud native, and the ones who are cloud native, they're perfectly fine running in, 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 in containers. So there's still a lot of, and there's st still a lot of, you know, uh, open source projects right now to solve that problem, but it's still not ideal. So, um, but I see that a lot of people using the platform, just, I just want to run uh, my database just natively on a VM instead of running it in a container, just to make sure it's run. It's because, yeah. Um, so monitoring. I mean, you, do, you, you get, of course, you, 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 if you run it in, in production and you have like a lot of uh, service, you really want to, to combine all those logs. So you need something to combine all those logs. And, and also, that, that's needed for debugging your container. So that's interesting. That, that's really important that you need that from, from your platform. And also uh, security. So basically, if you start with your image, which is already secure, I hope, <laughs> then you run it, of course, in, into uh, in production. And uh, there's a lot of ways to, to improve security. I mean, that's also part of you know when you uh, from if you're an operations guy, you already know that you install your firewalls and all that stuff. But it's also important that you, of course, be aware that you also can. I mean, for security wise, that you that you kept the CPU and the RAM, but also uh, make sure that container groups are, are installed on, on a different server, and maybe you, your container, uh, your platform needs something like uh, that you can deploy it on the VPC, and that you can exit through a Bastion server, and also verification of images. So it's really important also that you really want to know where that image is coming from. So if you say, I just want to deploy a new container, and you don't know where that image is coming from, you probably can deploy something vulnerable to your to your platform. So you make sure, and also Docker already provide that with, with, with signing of images, that you make sure that the images are deployed on your platform are um, secure. Um, so, 
So basically, what I'm trying to say is when you want to run document production and if you choose your platform, make sure that you do like proper orchestration, discovery, scaling, data management, monitoring, security. So Classic has that, but there's a lot of other competitors in the market who already have this platform, or you can build it yourself if you have a command power for it. But as, before you can start doing the right side, make sure that the left side is really uh, up to speed, so it's small, secure, performance, stable, and mutable. And I think if you, if you get your DevOps right, and if you go from microservice architecture, you get that right, and you create a minimal level image, and having to write in a platform to run containers, you probably don't go to hell running that thing in production. And um, I think that's a little bit the end of my talk. Um, so take a look at our uh, platform. Uh, we have a blog where we write about all the things about uh, Docker. Habitus is a, a Docker build phone tool. Uh, that's quite, uh, that's good to know because sometimes when you want to create small images, you have different build steps. For instance, if you, are people programming in Go? Go programming? Yeah. So if you have Go, you pull all, all the, um, all your, all your libraries and then you compile it into one binary and then you put that in, a, in an image. And normally you can do that with one Docker file, but still all your, your source code is still in your Docker file. What happens is you can have like different build steps that you can compile your binary, get rid of your get rid of your libraries and just pull, only pull the artifact inside the image and then you create the smallest possible image. And also if you are started with Docker and you want to containerize your monolith application, which is 70%, then you can also go to start with Docker. We have a starter project where you can easily analyze your code and then create uh, a Docker file to get you started. And so hopefully you learn something and maybe you want to discuss afterwards. I'm, I'm here to, to, to answer all the questions. Maybe <coughs> ask, we still have like 10 minutes left. So if there are any questions, yes. What does it mean for databases to be not uh, cloud native? What, 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 what does it work exactly? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, cloud native, sorry. The <coughs> native, uh, yeah. So, so if you, so wait, you mind you repeating can, the question? Oh yeah. So so uh, again. So if you the question is why is it difficult to run uh, a database in a container and what's the difference between a cloud native database and uh, like the old databases like my is just twenty years old. Um, so basically, if you want to scale my SQL. I mean, the persistency, I mean, that can be solved, but scaling MySQL, just running like a master slave with containers, you don't know where that container is running, so you need a lot of more, like, uh, you need a little bit of more, like, uh, plumbing code to get that working. And if you have, like, a native data, um, cloud native database, it's much easier to hook up, hook up into uh, the IP addresses and get that working because it's just moving. Uh, uh, the data around it's more for 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 uh, it's not the it's not the right answer. I, I hope this is yeah. your question, but it's um, so sca scaling my SQL in a container is much difficult than scaling, for instance, Elasticsearch in a container. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? How do you monitor containers? What tools do you use to monitor? These? Yeah, so there are a lot of tools on the market. Um, so basically, um, uh, we use, um, uh, for instance, Sysdick, you can use that one. So it just, you know, you install an agent on, on your, your Docker host and then we'll find all the all the, uh, the log files and all the things and, and, and we'll aggregate into and push it to some, you know, uh, one database where you can uh, look at it. So there's different solutions that you can install on your 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 your, uh, your server, but basically Docker, what Docker does is when you when you output to the standard out, uh, it will pick up all that data and put it into you know on the on the machine and you can just you know hook up into that and then move that data into for instance like an elk stack or something. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. When 
So the question is, if people, when people are running Docker in production, how many containers are running on a VM? So, <laughs> so 70% is just running one container on one VM. <laughs> so they're basically, um, yeah. But uh, but if I if if I look at the other the, like the twenty percent of our customers, some have like maybe like twenty containers running on, on one host, and and also we have one customer who running really small images, just little workers, and we have like a, a hundred containers running on one host. So it depends. It depends on of course how big your host is, of course, but um, it also depends on your architecture. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah. Do they also want to scale the instances, like the, the VMs, or they just uh, start with a few VMs and then, then uh, orchestrate Docker containers over a fixed set of VMs? Yeah, so this is a question about auto scaling. How do we do it? How, how is that done? So, the, the, of course, it depends on your platform. So, some platforms support auto scaling, meaning when you can say, okay, I want to just run 20, uh, 20 uh, containers, and if it's not, if the orchestrator Cannot, uh, the scheduler cannot, you know, put on the on the node. It says I can't only run like ten containers. Please add an extra node, and then you can say to your platform, just you know, in uh, just you know, um, add an extra node on my behalf, or you have to do it yourself. Uh, but the funny thing is that how a lot of people are using it, um, they're not the um, the Netflix of this world, basically. So. They just say, okay, just I, I spin up a couple of servers and then just run, run the containers and then leave it like that. And if I need more capacity because of more customers coming to my service, I just add an extra uh, container. But you see that that a small portion are requesting the auto scaling because they want to, you know, make 100% usage of the resources. And then and that's also nice with 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 containers. I think that you really can make use of the resources available and really. You know, consolidate uh, your server, your servers. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I have a similar question. So uh, about uh, scale, uh, scaling out automatically based on lo on requests or no requests. Uh, do you have a scenario like that in, in your own environment or yeah, which so, platform do you use? Yeah. So we, we build our our own platform. <coughs> so you can use right right now. So we we build also auto scaling, but it's quite hard because. The thing is, you. I mean, scaling your containers. That's not hard. But if you are going to delete servers and add servers on behalf of your custom, you 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 really know what you're doing, right? Yeah. Because you don't want to delete your servers with stuff running on, and then the customer calls, hey, you deleted your auto scale deleted the server. So what we're doing is that we collect all the data we have from all running servers, and then we we have this rule-based system where you can say if the requests are above this. Uh, if the requests are uh, going this request and the response time is below this mm -hmm. um, yeah, baseline, base, yeah. baseline, then add an extra server or instigate more more containers. So you never delete one you only add. Uh, yeah, from from now we only add, and if we if we also we delete servers, but the, the, the servers are put in a queue just to make sure. Mm -hmm. So they, then the customer can delete oh, it yeah. themselves, but we. Make sure that there's a queue before we delete the servers on, on their behalf. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have uh, example scenarios where you probably deleted a server once by accident, and what what uh, what happened? What, what was the kind of uh, complaints you had? Okay. When, when <laughs> you mean? Sorry, it probably happened. You probably deleted or oh, deleted some some server. Yeah, this time. is a story a long time ago when we just started Class Six yeah. in 2012. <laughs> Then we, we basically have two products. So we have Classics for Rails, so we, we're well known in the Rails community. And we started Docker, uh, Classics for Docker two years ago. But when we, we started our platform, then there was this, then we had like this automatically delete your server when you delete your stack. And uh, what happened that somebody deleted his, his stack and then he just was okay, so I delete my stack, which is, and then also the server was deleted. But then he realized that he didn't make made the backup, but we already deleted that server, so which is that image. yeah. So we deleted server on on this or something. So in the end, we were lucky because this version still had like a snapshot of that server. So we had, we were safe, but we we now explicit, you have explicitly 
to think like, okay, we can delete your server on your behalf and then make sure, I mean, yeah. And also, um, I know stories about uh, um, um, when you're not isolating your, your, I mean, if you run, like for instance, um, if you have like a scheduler, you can say to a scheduler, just, you know, run 20 uh, containers on my cluster. Um, so, basically, if you have like a testing environment and a development environment and a production environment, and you test something and you change your schedule to just, you know, delete those servers, and that information goes to production, your schedule will also delete those containers in production. So, you really make sure that you have systems in place, security systems in place that when you run in production, that um, that maybe running containers are not deleted uh, um, right away, or that you have like, I mean, you have to be like, careful with that. And do you know if platforms like Kubernetes or Mesos or Docker Swarm uh, support rule-based uh, scaling? Um, probably they have like plugins for it. Yeah. I don't know. Well, maybe we wrote our own mm -hmm. uh, auto scaler, so okay. I don't know. And you don't know. Okay. No. No, yeah. I mean, I, you know, if you do Mesos or, or Kubernetes or, 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 um, or Swarm, you can also specify how many containers are running on the Swarm. So it probably look, yeah. there's, there's probably like a, a, a basic scheduler in place, which looks like, okay, how many resources do I have? Can I install yeah, those yeah. containers somewhere? And then uh, I think, believe it, Docker Swarm, you can uh, add your own scheduler if you want to. So they have like a basic scheduler, but if you want something more advanced, you can write it yourself. Uh, but still, there's a lot of things going on. How the perfect schedule looks like, and all with the and so there's still a lot of things going on in, in that ecosystem. So there will be, there will be, you know, the next couple of months there will be, you know, a lot of things more on that uh, on that side. Yeah. Yes. I was wondering how you divide your customers across the servers. Is it possible for a customer uh, to share a server with another customer, or do you just create one server per client? Um, so, so the, the question is, uh, do clients share one server? Yeah. For example, yes. For example. Yeah, so, so th that depends on, I mean, if we have uh, digital agencies who are, who are using our platform, and what they're doing, they provision one server and run Docker on it, and then they run one Docker container for one customer, and then one Docker container for another customer, and then using our uh, load balancing and reverse proxying to, you know, uh, serve to different domains. But it's quite dangerous, because you don't have the isolation there, and still what, because, what, what, what and, uh, so that, that's possible, of course, with the platform. But what we normally see is that people just, you know, provision a small VM, and then run, uh, run that for one customer, and then they know exactly what to build to the customer, basically. Yeah. So you, if a couple of couple of digital agencies who are using our product, you see that they have like maybe like thirty different stacks, but it's only one server. So they manage like thirty servers, but just one server for each customer. I think uh, we're done here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.